Good afternoon and welcome to the ins and outs of the Fair Labor Standards Act. I'm Corey Argus and I am an attorney here at Polaro Mazza where I focus my practice on labor and employment law. We have a really broad labor and employment practice at Polaro, Mag at Polaro Mazza and wage and hour law which includes employers legal obligations under the Fair Labor Standards Act or the F FLSA as I'll be referring to it makes up a large part of our practice. If you've been listening to the news lately uh, and I know a lot of you have from all the questions regarding the FLSA we've been receiving lately, you know there are significant changes uh, with the law that are currently underway. So all the changes and implications for you as employers will be among the topics that we cover here today. And just to get us on the road, we first need to go through our disclaimer for this webinar. As I mentioned, the FLSA is under some major changes, some major changes that haven't taken place in, in quite a few years. And this is true for many of the legal topics in this webinar uh, series, but especially wage and hour law recently, and especially with regard to the FLSA. With that in mind, we just want to remind you that because the law is in such a state of flux, it should not be considered legal counsel, representation to you as an employer, materials covered here today, please don't rely on them indefinitely because, as I said, the law is in this area is one that is constantly and quickly evolving of late. As I said before, my name is Corey Argus. I'm an associate with Polaro Maz Law Firm. We're a full service law firm, proudly serving the Washington DC area uh, and the entire country for more than 25 years. We focus on uh, government contracts law. We have a full service law firm with business, corporate, labor and employment and litigation practice areas. So to just give you an overview as to what we're covering today, we'll be going over the minimum wage overtime pay, including covered and non-exempt employees, the new regulations that I've been introducing you to, just talking about a little bit, some strategic decision making for you as an employer to respond to these changes, record keeping requirements, and breaks for nursing mothers, which has become a bigger issue lately with lactation breaks, and we'll briefly go over child labor as well, just to cover all the topics that are under the FLSA. And what are not included are these topics that we have listed for you. So these are all things that surprise many employers a lot of times that are actually not included by uh, the laws with the Fair Labor Standards Act. This includes vacation, holiday, severance or sick pay, meal and rest periods, holidays that you receive off, vacations, premium pay for either weekends or holiday work, pay raises and fringe benefits, your discharge, any termination, the, the notice, the reasons for terminations, wage payment or collection procedures, the number of hours and days or days in a week that an employee may be required or scheduled to work. These are all surprising to many employers a lot of times or people not familiar with the FLSA, not included under the FLSA. So what is included? Well, first let's go over coverage. So the Fair Labor Standards Act covers, as we have here, pretty much everyone. If you're an employer, it's almost certain that you are covered. Uh, there are two separate coverage provisions in the Fair Labor Standards Act, one being the enterprise coverage, so pertaining to the actual businesses, so you may fall under the law in that aspect. Also, there is coverage pertaining to individuals, so the employees. So if even if you didn't fall under the coverage under the enterprise provisions more likely than not your employees would under the individual coverage uh, really it's only sort of family businesses and we're talking about small family businesses that only employ really their immediate family members that are are excluded from either from both enterprise and individual coverage provisions there are however some exceptions of workers that are not covered uh, by the FLSA, so they're not subject to the obligations uh, for employers under the law. And that would include independent contractors, volunteers, interns, and trainees. Uh, independent contractors is a another category that you, you want to be careful with, even though those workers, as I just said, are not subject to the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, there is a tendency by employers sometimes to confuse what they may call an independent contractor with someone who is actually an individual employed by the employer. Um, you get your casual or your regular scheduled workers and employers run into trouble, particularly with the way that the courts have been uh, leaning lately uh, with labeling those individuals as independent contractors and thinking that they're not 
subject to coverage under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So one of the two big topics that are covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act, the first would be minimum wage. And so right now, as many of you probably know, it, the national minimum wage, the federal level, is $7.25 per hour. And that was instituted in July of 2009. So that's why we have the for now up there. Uh, the minimum wage is increased by statute. So that means the, these aren't automatic yearly increases. This requires legislative action. Uh, right now, going along with that 7.25 per hour for, for typical workers is 2.13 per hour for tipped workers. So that's the minimum wage for people like waiters at restaurants. However, if you do employ tipped workers, the expectation for the Department of Labor and the government is that uh, the gap between 2.13 per hour and 7.25 per hour will be made up with things like tips. And if employees are not receiving a combined total of $7.25 per hour, then the employer is obligated to uh, pay the employee wages to get them up to that minimum of $7.25 per hour. We have CPA, CPI advocacy up there. So there have been a lot of moves lately. It hasn't happened at the federal level, but there have been a lot of interest groups and lobbyists uh, on, on the employer side, um, uh, pardon me, on the employee side, advocating for tying the minimum wage to the consumer price index. And whether that will happen or not, we don't know. But going along with that, um, we get into the next topic under minimum wage, the state, county, and local mu municipalities. They all uh, have the ability to also institute a minimum wage. So you have to always take into account, not only are you complying with the federal minimum wage of $7.25 per hour, but are you subject to any either state, county or local laws that would obligate you as an employer to pay a higher minimum wage than $7.25 per hour. Uh, as of the end of, of, of October last year, 29 states and the District of Columbia have a minimum wage uh, above the federal minimum wage. And this it varies greatly. And you can see in 2014 we have listed lawmakers in a, a whole slew of other states uh, have been taking either legislation forward or taking ballot measures uh, on increasing minimum wage. And with that CPI advocacy we talked about earlier, a lot of the states are moving along in that direction. The, the federal level uh, and the, the federal legislature may not be able to get legislation going based on increases tied to the consumer price index, but that's the direction that a lot of states and local governments are going. Um, and just <clears throat> a, a couple of the big ones, DC is currently at 10.50 an hour. Uh, it's going to increase to 11.50 per hour on July 1st of this year. For any of you local em employers or anybody uh, who read the Washington Post yesterday, you saw that the council here passed uh, a committee measure uh, voting to increase min the minimum wage in the District of Columbia to $15 per hour by 2020. So they're on track to do that. It will still require additional votes, but that's where they're headed toward. California is currently $10 an hour. Uh, they also have legislation committing the state to increase to $15 per hour by 2022. New York is currently $9 an hour. They've also passed legislation to move their minimum wage to $15 per hour. So not to belabor the point, but you need to make sure that you're checking not only the federal minimum wage, but also what potential state and local laws might apply to you for minimum wage. The other large aspect of the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, that em employers uh, find their legal obligations that they're regularly dealing with would be overtime. And so with the law under the Fair Labor Standards Act, you have uh, covered and you have non you have covered non-exempt employees and so if you are non-exempt if you are covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act then you are entitled to overtime and that many of you are familiar with is one and one half times the regular rate of pay and you as an employer have to pay employees that one and a half times their regular rate of pay for any hours they work over 40 hours per week. Now this 
is sometimes confused uh, by employers and by employees as well. You know, and they might come to you with uh, the feeling that they've been shortchanged by what you're paying them in overtime. But this overtime is not required pay for work on weekends, for work on holidays, regular days of rest. It's only if overtime is worked on those days. So if they're working over 40 hours per week, they, they reach that threshold, they go over it on a day that's a weekend or a holiday, then yes, they're entitled to overtime, but not strictly speaking just because they work on those days. And again, the same with the minimum wage laws, you want to remember to always check your state laws. We've got California and Alaska listed here. California has uh, in their state overtime law, one and one half times the regular rate of pay for hours worked in excess of eight, da eight hours in any one day. So not the 40 hour threshold that you have to meet, but in any one day, if you work over eight hours, then you are entitled to one and a half times your regular rate of pay. Uh, and California also has up to two times the regular rate of pay for hours worked in excess of 12 hours in any one day. Alaska, similar to the one and a half times uh, for daily work, also requires employers to pay employees that one and a half times their regular rate of pay for any hours worked in excess of eight hours in one day. So again, you want to make sure you know all the relevant laws and make sure that you're in compliance, uh, not only with the, the federal standard, but what may be applicable to you in your home state or if you have employees in different areas of the country, you need to make sure that each different area you're, you're knowledgeable and complying with the law that is applied there. So with overtime, I mentioned it's 40 hours, over 40 hours of work in a single work week. So what does a work week mean? It's any fixed and regularly recurring period of 168 hours or seven consecutive 24-hour periods. This doesn't mean you're on a regular Monday through Friday schedule and the seven days are Monday through Sunday. It's not the same for all employers. You can choose the work week uh, as, as you want to to define it, but you have to be consistent. You cannot one week define it as Monday through Sunday, the next week it go to uh, Wednesday through Tuesday. Um, the Department of Labor, the government is going to be on the lookout and, and wants to avoid employers taking advantage of moving their work week around to avoid paying overtime. So you have to be consistent. It doesn't have to be the same as every other employer, but you have to have it consistent. And there's no limit on the actual number of hours that employees uh, may work in a work week if they're older than 16. You can go ahead and have those employees work more, it's just whether or not you have to pay them overtime. And for a lot of our government contractor uh, clients and employers, we have here no comp time for the private sector. And so um, comp time is sort of a concept that is really um, related to government workers, to public sector workers generally. Um, and by comp time, we mean providing employees with essentially extra leave rather than um, paying those employees time and a half. Um, again, this is a public sector concept, so if you're a private sector employer and you happen to be having employees that work alongside public sector employees regularly, sometimes this, this gets confusing, either on the employer's end or on the employee's end. But comp time is not equivalent to overtime. If you're a private employer, and your, your employees are non-exempt employees, they're covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act, then you have to pay them overtime for the hours they work in excess of 40 hours in any one work week. So we've talked about the work week. Well, when are employees actually working? What are hours worked? And we'll go through a few examples uh, as we get further along in the presentation to try and show you, flesh out some of these different concepts and, and let you try and think through some, some scenarios that we regularly see. So the hours worked under the law, generally speaking, uh, those would include all the time during which an employee is required to be on your property, on your premises as an employer, to be on duty, or to be at a specific workplace. And the hours worked issue uh, creates 
what we what, what is called off the clock uh, time issues for employers that we we see a lot, um, and so this will will bring up issues that uh, include performing work outside the usual schedule, and an employee uh, will feel pressured not to report that time. Um, that can become an off the clock issue uh, and a legal issue for the employer. We see issues involving time on tasks that an employer does not regularly regard as compensable, but may in fact actually be compensable. And then we'll see also issues involving uh, disputes over the accuracy um, or the, the correct uh, recording of, of time, so timekeeping procedures. These all are potential issues that could lead to uh, overtime difficulties. So the Department of Labor is the government agency that uh, is responsible for overseeing, for enforcing Fair Labor Standards Act. And so as an employer, if you have uh, potential legal issues, you're probably going to be uh, involved with Department of Labor. And so we have some questions here for you about what do you think the Department of Labor would do? And the first question is, so you have employees working at an electronics warehouse that are required to go through security procedures when they enter and when they leave the building. What do you all think? Would this time be compensable? And so, surprisingly, to some, maybe not to others, no, this time would not be compensable. And we'll get into reasons why uh, in the next few slides. Second question we have here, employees working in a factory need to put on safety equipment that's provided for them when they get to work. When does their work time start? Do you think it starts when they put the safety equipment on, after they start actually doing their work? When would their work time start? And the answer to that, which is a difficult one for em employers to deal with, is it depends. So um, specialized protective gear, the courts have really come, come down on, on, in many different ways on, on this second question, the issue I've, I've posed. Um, specialized protective gear is generally considered to be associated with compensable time. But the courts, like I said, differ greatly about whether the time spent uh, putting on or putting off other types of specialized gear, whether it's protective or not, um, if that is something that should be included in compensable time. And so you can see here, the, these are the, the legal standards that the, the courts are dis often discussing and grappling with. So you have your, your pre-shift, your post-shift activities, your preliminary or post-preliminary activities, sometimes putting on and taking off equipment is called donning and doffing, however you label it. Um, the courts hold that the activity must be integral and indispensable uh, to the employee's principal activities if it's going to be considered compensable time. And that's why in, in the previous slide on that first question um, that the going through and the entering the, the, the security uh, in the building was not found to be compensable time. And this comes from a case that involved Amazon. As you can see here, um, the court held that the activities have to be an intrinsic element of the principal activities that an employee is required to perform and one with which the employee cannot dispense if he is to perform his principal activities. And what, and what does that all actually mean? So the, fa <clears throat> the facts of the case there were that these were employees essentially in a, in a big warehouse. They were responsible for the shipping of products for Amazon in a big warehouse. And the their principal activity there, the court found, was packaging products for shipment. So the court found that even though these employees to leave the warehouse at the end of the day were required to go through a post-shift security screening to essentially ensure that the employees were not stealing any of the products in the warehouse, um, this was required by the employer, but the court still found, no, this is not an integral and indispensable uh, to your principal activity as employees responsible for packaging products for shipment. So 
it's it can be extremely difficult um, and we understand the frustration this can cause with employers sometimes to actually figure out okay is this something that would be work time do I have to pay my employee do I not have to pay my employee what is it and and the difficult thing to realize is that courts come out um, with very different reasoning on these issues and so it can be extremely difficult another set of questions we have here for you regarding what do you think the Department of Labor would do in, in these particular scenarios so the first employees working on an army base are told by their government customer to make sure they arrive 15 minutes before the start of the shift to ensure they are not late for work do you as an employer have to pay for this time and the answer here would be yes um, if it's a preparatory activity um, it's going to be compensable even though it's you're arriving 15 minutes early just to make sure you're there on time basically uh, you know in preparation for your workday to start if it's required by employers rules or going back to what we said before if it's an in integral and indispensable uh, to your principal activity of work then it's going to be compensable time so if you're requiring your employees to be there if it's your customer that's told them and the employees are then required to be there early it's going to be compensable time second question here an employee comes to work and without being told to start working begins working do you have to pay the employee for the time that he's he started before uh, he was told to work and the answer there again is is yes they're on your, your property uh, they're engaging in your work um, particularly if you're aware of this that that the work is taking place um, the employee doesn't have to be told to start working for it to be compensable time so you've seen from these scenarios that this can really kind of be a nuanced and, and difficult evaluation at times um, so what can you do to minimize your risk as an employer um, and one of the big problems that employers face is that the Department of Labor essentially will enforce a, a strict liability of sorts for um, violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act. If you're not paying the employees for time that they're actually working, if you're not paying them overtime for time over their their 40 hours in a work week, um, they're going to look at it as you're the employer, you're aware, these employees worked, you're liable. And they're going to go after you for whatever it is that has been brought to their intention, attention. Um, and so one of the best ways to go about minimizing your risk in these situations as an employer is you need to have uh, policies that are both clear and enforced and both aspects of that are important we're talking about your overtime and your timekeeping policies in particular you have to be clear with your overtime policy this needs to be pre-approved only work overtime when it's been submitted to your supervisor and they've signed off on it however you you go about it with your procedure you need to be clear to tell them no overtime unless we say so your timekeeping you need to be clear that all time worked must be recorded it doesn't matter if it's your normal nine to five whatever it is be precise be accurate and record everything it, if it falls outside of that nine to five you're still to record it if you work less than that nine to five you're still to record it and having clear policies means your employees will be on notice and then you as the employer you also have to make sure you enforce these policies uh, consistently uniformly um, to your em employees you need to make sure your, your supervisors your frontline managers are aware of these policies aware of their importance and are keeping an eye out for any potential violations and if there are violations then you address it um, whether it be discipline or otherwise um, you need to enforce these policies and Generally, these, these, these policies will be found in an employee handbook. Um, almost every employer has one now. 
is something that we strongly encourage to all of our clients um, and encourage them to have these clear policies in there that they can consistently enforce. Typically, you'll have a, a handbook acknowledgement at the end of the handbook where the employee will sign off, yes, I've reviewed, yes, I agree to abide by all these policies. None of these policies can be changed unless in writing, signed by the president or CEO of the company. Um, that's your evidence there that the employees were on notice, that these policies were in effect, they knew about it, they agreed to it, and if you're uniformly and consistently enforcing the policies, disciplining employees if they're not recording their time accurately, disciplining employees if they're working overtime and they're not supposed to be, then that's a great mechanism for minimizing your risk for violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act. So a few more examples we'll go through. You just hired a new assistant and you know your files are a bit backed up. There's a lot of work to do. You tell him you will approve overtime if he needs it, but he must get it approved so that you can help distribute work if needed. The assistant doesn't say anything to you and you think everything is fine. A month later, you notice that the assistant emailed you at 11 p.m. on a Saturday night. What should you do? Well, as I just sort of got into with the, the, the policies that need to be clear and enforced, if you're telling your employees that overtime needs to be approved and then they're working outside of the normal hours above their 40 hours in a week, then you still need to pay the employee, but you can discipline them. So you discipline that employee, but you pay him. You told him you needed to have the overtime approved. It didn't get approved. Doing work outside uh, of the normal hours, outside of the office. You discipline them, but you pay them. You, you owe them the compensation under the law, but that doesn't stop you from disciplining them. And if it continues, you're within your rights to, to can, you know, go into continue with progressive discipline up to including termination. Following up on that scenario, one year later you're audited by the DOL. The Department of Labor says that despite your records, their interviews lead the Department of Labor to believe that the assistant worked overtime in the amount of three hours per week on average. <clears throat> what are your options? And a lot of times it's um, surprising to employers that, well, they're coming in and they're averaging these, these hours. What, what is that about? They don't have proof of when this employee actually works, so they're just going to assume. And as I said earlier, with the um, overtime um, issue we talked about, that it's, it's, it's going to be strict liability in the Department of Labor's eyes. So you could say okay and agree with the DOL and just take the averaging because that's something they do all the time. You could try to refute the number of hours with some sort of proof or documentation. Um, that can be sort of extremely difficult to do because you've got emails. How can you really tell when, when the, the time is, is that the employee is working? So that could be difficult. Or you could just totally push back on DOL and say, okay, well, we don't agree with you, and you force the issue. Make them pursue it, and eventually you go to – uh, a hearing with them, it's an administrative hearing, you can make them put on their testimony, have the employees come in and testify, have, have the, the Department of Labor put on their evidence. But um, averaging is something that happens all the time and that's sort of a function of the Department of Labor viewing this um, in, in sort of a strict liability lens. So exemptions from overtime, we went over that, said I would cover that in the beginning, so Let's get into that. So this is, we're first going to cover exemptions from overtime pay only. And so we have the various uh, categories of employees that uh, will be exempt from overtime pay only. It's uh, a lot of commissioned employees, uh, sales workers who work on things like boats, aircrafts, uh, mechanics that are servicing uh, trucks and cars. Um, employees of railroads and air carriers. You see this a lot in, in labor and employment law. Uh, they're also exempt 
or they're not included in the coverage for the National Labor Relations Act. Um, so railroad and air carriers are, are typically out of the normal uh, coverage there. You've got things like broadcasting stations, you know, there are announcers, news editors, chief engineers. Um, you, you can see some of these things are coming from different groups that say, you know, we don't have these normal uh, jobs. They have probably some, some lobbyists in the ears of, of, of who is determining coverage, motion picture uh, theaters, those sorts of things. Um, farm workers, domestic service workers we have here as well, but You'll, you'll notice there it's only if they are living in the employer's residence. So this would be something like an au pair that actually lives with you. It's not just uh, if it's a, a domestic service worker, they're not entitled to overtime. They are unless they live uh, in the employer's residence. So then we also have exemptions from both the minimum wage and overtime pay. And so these are probably a lot of the things that you've been hearing around. This is, this, this is getting into the big changes under the Fair Labor Standards Act um, that, that were just announced that are currently being rolled out. And so you have, which you're all probably familiar with, hearing the executive, administrative, and professional employees exemptions. Uh, exemptions also apply to outside sales employees, employees in certain computer-related occupations, seasonal workers, farm workers, casual babysitters. And so, as I mentioned, the executive, administrative, and professional exemption is probably what a lot of you are very interested in. And so we're going to go through the, the details of that. So under this exemption from the Fair Labor Standards Act, you have two tests. You have a job duties test, and then you have a salary basis test. So the job duties test obviously pertaining to uh, what work you actually do and are responsible for as an employee. The salary basis test means that you have to be paid uh, on, a, on a salary basis, not as, as an hourly employee, and you have to meet the minimum salary thresholds. Um, employers will a lot of times run into issues by saying, well, they're named, they're, they're named uh, a manager, they're named a professional type position or job title. Your, your title, your description, those do not determine your exempt status. If they're accurate in the description of the position, then, then sure, that, that is, is helpful, but the job title and the job description alone will not, in the Department of, Labor, Department of Labor's eyes, uh, make your employees exempt if, if it does not appear otherwise that they should be. And so with the executive duties test, we've, we've set out the the different aspects of it here. So the employee, as, as an executive, their duties have to include regularly supervising two or more other full-time employees. The management has to be the primary duty of, of that employee's position. They have to have genuine input. It can't just be, like we said, in their description and title only. They have to have genuine input into the job status of other employees, and these include uh, the different things that we've listed down there, the things you typically associate with uh, management, hiring, firing, promotions, job assignments, what different responsibilities they allocate to different people, um, setting your rate of pay, setting your hours of work, looking at what kind of productivity employees have, handling complaints, disciplining employees, uh, determining the equipment, the materials to be used, planning, budgeting, providing for the safety and security of the workplace, everything you sort of generally associate with management activities. So to meet the executive duties test, one half of the exemption test under the Fair Labor Standards Act for overtime, you have to have these duties that we've set out here. The second out of, out of sort of the big three of what are typically called the white collar exemptions is the administrative duties test. And this is the duties that are set forth under this test mean you have to be performing office or non-manual work. So you can't be doing general labor um, where, where you're, you're performing some sort of uh, 
really physical work. It has to be directly related to the management or general business operations of the employer or the employer's customers. And there has to be an exercise of independent judgment and discretion about matters of significance. So they have to have some sort of ability to uh, apply their thoughts, their judgment, their discretion on, on things that are happening in uh, the employer's workplace, and it has to be a matters, matter of significance. And so what are those kinds of matters of significance? Um, so you're talking about operations versus production employees. So things like human rate resources, responsibility for that, or for payroll, for quality control, for public relations, for marketing. These are the sorts of uh, aspects of work that if you're responsible for them, that is getting into the operational side. That is getting into uh, a place where you will be exercising independent judgment and discretion of a matter of significance for uh, the employer's business operations or management. So uh, those are the aspects of the administrative duties test um, for exemption under the Fair Labor Standards Act. So here's an example we have here. An employer hires an office manager and the position requires that the person orders supplies, answer tel answers telephones, proofreads documents for the president, and basically just ensures that the office runs smoothly. There are only two other employees who work in the office and they are high level executives. Well, how should this employee be classified? Do they meet an exemption or are they covered non-exempt employee under the Fair Labor Standards Act? Here we would classify this employee as non-exempt. They'd still have to be paid for overtime under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, what kind of other information might you want to know? So we've given you some things here that the employee kind of does general sort of executive assistant, secretarial work, that sort of thing. Um, and there's two other employees and they're, they're high level executives so the employee probably isn't supervising them. But what else might you want to know? Well, you know, the position here it says it ensures that the office runs smoothly. Well, what's included in runs smoothly? Are they also responsible for overseeing and implementing payroll, for marketing, all those things we, we, we mentioned before? Are they responsible for quality control, other business operations types of job duties? If the answer is yes to that and that is really where their work is going, then potentially they are actually falling under the exemption. But as we've described it just right here, those are not uh, job duties that would qualify for the administrative exemption. And so this employee would be classified as non-exempt. The professional's duty test. So sort of the last of the three uh, big white collar exemptions. So this is for work that is predominantly intellectual, requires specialized education, involves the exercise of discretion and independent judgment. An advanced degree uh, or you perform the same type of work that someone with an advanced degree performs. Again, it's the position and not the person. So typical individuals, occupations that fall uh, within this professional duties exemption would be things like lawyers, doctors, architects, engineers, accountants, actuaries, all those sort of uh, professional with advanced schooling typically we associate with those positions, they would fall under the professional exemption. So another scenario, an employer hires architects at various sites in the United States. There are a couple of architects who have all the requisite degrees but require more management than the others. Are these architect, architects requiring that require the additional management? Are they exempt or are they non-exempt? And again, this, this can be a tough one here, but uh, we've, we had a client, we had uh, a case where these employees were non-exempt. Because they required that additional management, they were essentially taking on 
what would be considered uh, or or found to be um, assistance, architect assistance, essentially. Um, if you're lacking that discretion, independent judgment because you require that management, then even though you may have a, an architecture degree and maybe working alongside other architect, architects, um, you can still be found to be non-exempt. And so what other <clears throat> information might you want to know? So it's all those things we were, we were just talking about. How much, how much supervision do they require? What are they actually performing? Are they simply just taking orders from all the other architects, even though they're an architect as well? Or are they actually making judgments and decisions on their own um, in, in that area of expertise as an architect? If they're, if they're not using and applying their expertise and their discretion, then it's, it's likely that you could get into a situation um, as, as we've, we've seen before uh, with what the Department of Labor classified as non-exempt employees. So that was the job duties test. The second half of, of the evaluation is the salary basis test. And so to meet the salary basis test, your employees have to be paid a salary that does not fluctuate based on hours worked. So if you're going to be considered exempt, if your employees are not going to be paid overtime, well, if they're working 60 hours a week, then great. You don't have to, you don't have to pay them for those extra 20. But if they're working 35, you can't deduct for falling below 40. It has to be uh, a salary that does not fluctuate based on your hours worked. If the employee is ready, willing, and able to work, like I said, it, it, it's the deductions that get you into trouble. If the employee is ready, willing, and able to work, your, your deductions cannot be made uh, for time when the work is not available. There are different situations where deductions from pay will be permissible. So, for example, if the company is open for business, the employer may make deductions in full day increments from the salary of their exempt employees if they're not coming to work due to personal reasons other than sickness or disability. And examples here would be inclement weather or disaster, those sorts of things where the employees actually decide not to come in, but you as a company are open for business. Permissible deductions from pay can include leave for sickness and disability if you have a plan providing for paid sick leave or disability leave in full day increments. So you have to have uh, an employer plan in place that covers sickness and disability that provides for paid leave for those reasons to be able to make permissible deductions. Um, if you suspend an employee or or they're, they're disciplined, sent home, then you can also make a permissible deduction from their pay. There would be no real point if you were as an employer disciplining an employee and suspending them from a day of work and then not able to uh, not pay them for that day. Partial weeks at higher termination um, and you can require employees to use accrued paid leave either in, in partial day or full day increments. So the new regulations that have just recently come out go into effect December 1st, 2016. The old regulations held that uh, that salary basis threshold at $455 per week. It's increased more than double to $913 per week. So that means the annual salary goes from uh, 23,660 per year to over $47,000 per year. With the old regulations, there were no automatic increases. We are now going to have uh, increases every three years. So this the increase will start January 1st, 2020. It's going to be tied to the 40th wage percentile uh, in the old regulations, you could not include bonuses to meet the th salary threshold. In the new regulations, you may include as an employer non-discretionary bonuses for up to 10%, and these have to be paid reconciled quarterly. Um, and so these are things like incentive payments tied to productivity or profitability, and that's how you, you, you get into uh, non-discretionary bonuses that can count towards that salary threshold. 
highly compensated employees. With the new regulations, uh, it has bumped up the threshold by $34,000. So currently, to, to meet the minimum there, highly compensated employees have to make $100,000 per year, effective December 1st this year, $134,000 and change. Um, and again, that may consist of commissions and non-discretionary bonuses. So what do you do as an employer? Uh, it's important to go through an assessment and audit. You need to evaluate the impact on your workforce. It's possible that this really will not affect you all that much. Either all of your employees already fell uh, into the, the non-exempt category or the salary basis has not increased enough to affect all of your exempt employees. But if you're an employer where that's not the case, you need to figure out, well, how much overtime are your employees who are currently exempt, how much overtime would they be working if, if, they, if they were non-exempt employees? Are they all working 60 or 70 hours a week and they're, they're going to fall below that $40,000, $47,000 threshold? Well, then you're probably going to be looking at quite a bit of overtime that you're going to have to pay once the rules go into effect. Um, you need to balance that with the thought, okay, if I've got somebody at you know, $45,000 right, right now, does it make sense to bump them up over the 47, put them closer to $50,000 and avoid that paying uh, of overtime? What other policies do you have in place that will be affected? Where you're, will your email policies, your recording time policies be affected? If they are being affected, you need to think about revising them, reissuing them, and speaking with your employees about, about them. What kind of training will you need to complete that? Not only for your employees, but also potentially for your supervisors. If they're not familiar with employees having to accurately record their time because they're all exempt um, and you, you didn't have to worry about overtime and keeping all those time records straight, well now do your supervisors need training as well? Are there any employees you have that are currently classified uh, correctly or incorrectly under the duties test. This, this change in regulations is sort of good cover um, for employers to look at their employees and their classifications and figure out, okay, salary basis threshold is changing, but let me look at the duties test of all my employees as, as well if, if I'm considering them exempt before this rule change goes into effect. The change in rules are an easy sort of timing for you as an employer to go to, to someone and say, you know what, actually, your duties don't meet any of these exemptions. So we're now classifying you as non-exempt. Um, this is in conjunction with the, the DOL regulations that just, that just have gone out. And do having exempt versus non-exempt employees affect any of your benefits plans? For, for some of our clients, that's the case, so you need to look at that as well. So after you assess your employees, your, your workforce, you need to get into some strategic planning on this. Um, are you going to raise your wage rates? Are you going to convert people to hourly? What does it make sense to do? Are you going to be now obligated to pay a ton of overtime to some of these employees that it makes it worth your while to, to bump them up over the $47,000 and change? Or does it make sense to put somebody into an hourly position now and maybe lower their, their hourly wage rate knowing that uh, the overtime they're going to be entitled to is going to increase what, what they're actually going to be paid uh, if you're only looking at the hourly wages? You have to take into account all the non-monetary considerations um, that there, there are going to be consequences of this rule change. Uh, a big one that is sort of sometimes surprising and sometimes if you think about it, I guess not so much, but um, employees take it sort of as a badge of honor uh, being an exempt employee, being in, in that exempt category. Um, and then if they're moved down into being non-exempt, uh, people sort of take issue with that. They, they, they like having that exempt status 
tied to them as an employee. And so, you know, while it may have as an employer may have no bearing on what you know you're thinking about the employees it it, it might have uh, sort of uh, morale significant morale consequence um, to your employees well you have to reduce your, your base pay uh, knowing like we said before that increased overtime means you'll be having to, to pay more on that end so you need to reduce the the base pay of employees to to even it out and again, that's another non-monetary consideration to think about with your employees. Nobody wants to see their pay go down. So if someone is, is going from exempt to being non-exempt, they're now being paid hourly at a lower rate, um, that's something you're, gonna need, you're going to need to, to communicate with them uh, effectively, the reasons for it, um, and, and why you know, they're still an important employee. And this, this isn't necessarily something that it says about them, but just the rule changes. Um, your non-discretionary commissions and bonuses, we don't see this a ton with people, but if you have those, you know, you can get that, that 10%. So um, that's a consideration whether or not you can meet the salary basis threshold. Your effect on remote workers, this gets back into your policies. Um, those kinds of workers, it can be much more difficult to keep tabs on them, make sure they're, they're really... Um, recording their time and working when they're supposed to. And, and like I said, a communication campaign is important as well because um, your employees need to know the reasons for these things. And if they're just blindsided, it, 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 it can be uh, difficult. Private versus federal contracts. So your effect on pricing. For you know a, a private employer, um, you just increase the price of your widget. For a federal contractor, that, that, that could be different. Um, your, your increased costs due to overtime or bumping up salary, um, you know, that has an impact on your bottom line, particularly with things like a, a firm fixed price contract. What is that going to do to you? We're encouraging all of our clients to really look at the contract language um, in your, your contracts. Is there any flexibility to mess around with the, the FTEs, the full-time employees on your contract? Or is it a possibility to negotiate overtime with the government? What, what kind of rate can you get for that? Are they going to be willing to, to negotiate with you or are they going to they gonna stand pat? Um, you're going to have to take into account that the future costs, as I said, this will increase every, every three years, so the future costs associated with the automatic increases. Um, and in addition, any prevailing wage law. So particularly with Service Contract Act uh, contracts, if you now have employees who are formerly exempt, they're falling under the salary basis threshold. Well, if you're having a lot of employees that, that fall be below that threshold now, they're not going to be uh, exempt under the Service Contract Act um, because that the Fair Labor Standard Act exemptions is, is how you get out of the prevailing wage being applicable to those employees. And so now those employees are going to be entitled to the wages and the wage determination and the fringe benefits, the vacation, the health and welfare, and everything that goes along with it. Complaints. So complaints by employees to the company. Um, as with most labor and employment laws, retaliation is prohibited. You want to investigate any complaints that you receive regarding violations of the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, independently if necessary. Um, you should look into can your HR department handle this or do I need to bring in uh, someone outside, potentially uh, an attorney, a, a law firm. You want to address any concerns that are actually brought up. You don't want to just go through the, the process of an investigation and not actually address what's happening. You need to look. Is this systemic? Is this just one supervisor that had issues with an employee working overtime and getting it pre-approved and didn't want to deal with it? Or is this something where your supervisors overall don't understand? Um, you need to really figure out, is your left hand talking to your right hand? Is this just an isolated issue? And when the DOL becomes involved, they'll be beginning with an investigation phase. They basically go two years back, looking at the, the hours that the employees worked, the wages that they've been paid. Um, it's important to, to seek counsel for this. Um, if you can't resolve at the investigation phase, this essentially goes to an administrative law judge, um, an administrative hearing can then be appealed to the courts. Um, and, and additionally, there, there's a private right of action for, for many aspects of this. So even if DOL isn't focusing on enforcement of a, a certain area, such as uh, rounding of time, which is allowed in the 
you know, under the deal as enforcement guidance, but we see plaintiff's attorneys that actually go after uh, employers a lot more on that. So these are the other sort of just general aspects we have up there for you of the Fair Labor Standards Act. There's record keeping, poster requirements, employee information you have to you have to have. So for record keeping, how long should the records be retained? Well, it's three years for things like payroll records, CBAs, sales and purchase records, and two years for the records uh, that you're basing your wage computations on. So time cards, piecework tickets, that sort of thing. Lactation breaks. So this is uh, become, like I said earlier, a, a sort of hot topic of late. Um, it was recently added by uh, the ACA or Obamacare um, for non-exempt employees. And basically the employers have to provide a private place. It can't be a bathroom. It's shielded from view, intrusion from coworkers for uh, employees to express breast milk. Um, and again, as with other, the, the minimum wage, the overtime laws, this does not preempt state laws that provide for greater protection. So when you have an interaction between a state law that covers uh, lactation breaks, minimum wage, overtime, um, with the federal laws, whichever provides for the greater benefit, that you're, you're going to have to go up to that level as uh, an employer. Um, and, and a lot of states have passed uh, lactation break uh, laws. California, um, it covers all employees, not just non-exempt employees, so it's different than the, the federal law. Um, there's no one-year cap on how long uh, you have to provide the breaks, which is what it's capped at um, under the federal law. Um, New York, similarly, covers all employers, so it's not, it doesn't go the employee route, but it covers all employers. So you need to make sure you're complying with all of those. Um, youth at work, uh, this isn't something we run into all that often, but obviously this is covered by the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, Children of any age generally can work for businesses that are entirely owned by their parents. Um, and we have all the different requirements, you know, 14, 15, 16. Um, they're all different things as to the type of work the, the um, youth can be employed for um, and, and how long they can do it. So best practices. As we said at the outset, you want clear and enforced policies, particularly now with the new regulation going into place, you want to audit yourself. You want to ask your employees, you not only look at, you know, from your perspective what the employees do, but you want to ask the employees, okay, what are you actually doing on a daily basis? What does your job entail? Uh, you want to question your employees about overtime. Uh, make sure that if they're, they're working it and you're requiring pre-approval, they're getting pre-approval. You want to check email and phone use because if they're doing this outside of the office, Generally, that's, that's going to be compensable time, and so you're going to be liable as an employer. So, um, you know, it's obviously very ubiquitous now that there's email on phones, there's internet on phone, um, whether or not you have employer-issued phones. Um, you want to have a policy that covers all of those uh, aspects that can potentially lead to liability. You want to review your exemptions annually and at contract renewal. Um, like I said before, this change in the law is, is a good um, opportunity for you, just timing-wise, to, to actually look at everything. Okay, do my employees meet the duties test? Do they meet the, the salary basis threshold? Um, but you want to go through that annually because sometimes jobs change and sometimes duties transfer from one, one position to another. Um, and that contract renewal, obviously, you want to look at that because if you have an exempt versus a non-exempt employee, you want that difference. Uh, in the in the contract, if at all possible, you don't want to be stuck paying for overtime when it's not provided for in the contract. You want to look, like I said, if if job responsibilities have actually changed, uh, has there been a shift in the in the work? Have there been other positions added that have taken on responsibility? Have there been positions that have been eliminated that have transferred responsibility? Um, and what does your contract actually require? Does it expose you to any liability? Um, and if you go through all these steps, you know, hopefully you can minimize that liability to yourself. So, you know, our, our parting points here, you want a good handbook, ethics manual, you want policies uh, that are clear, that you enforce consistently, uniformly, you want to evaluate your strategic goals, 
uh, the opportunities that you have, and you want to regularly audit yourself. Um, if you need any assistance with that, you know, it's, it's a good idea if you're, if you're not terribly familiar, if you're having trouble, or when there are big changes like that, to, to seek um, outside help. And, you know, attorneys at law firms, um, us at Polaro Mazza, we're happy to help with that. Um, we deal with this on a daily basis. And, you know, we're, we're keeping abreast of, of the changes here. Um, some of the requirements are unclear, but um, we're, we're on, on top of this as, as the legal community has had a lot of commentary on this um, and are, are looking um, to see exactly what employers have to deal with. So with all of that, I do see that we've, we've had a bunch of questions. I know we covered a lot of ground. Um, I will try to, to follow up with as, as many of you as I can. Um, some of the questions I know we have are um, where you can get these slides. I know that you, you can get them actually on this webinar and on the Playroom as a website. Um, if you have any specific questions you'd like to follow up with, um, feel free please to contact us. My contact information is here as well as the firm's uh, information. And I hope you have uh, found this informative and are on your way to uh, dealing with this rule change in the best way possible. Thank you.